is Wednesday, March 11th, 2015. My name is Damian Carlson, otherwise known as Six Foot Dad on Twitter. And uh, tonight's presenter is Mr. Rob Hirschfeld, known as Z Hickle on Twitter, and he will be talking with us about Open Crowbar. Um, you can find all of our podcasts at professionalvmware.com slash brownbag. Uh, we recently had a little bit of a webinar hiccup, so if you are listening to this via an RSS subscription, uh, you'll need to go back into our website, click the link for the webinar, and re-register. The way that GoToWebinar works is kind of wonky, and uh, yeah, their support leaves a few things to be desired sometimes. So I apologize for that, but uh, yeah, if you can go ahead and re-register, you'll be able to start getting the regular webinar emails as those come out from GoTo. So again, my name is Damian Carlson. Rob Hirschfeld is our guest. Uh, I will go ahead and get things started and hand it over to you, Rob. Oh, uh, one quick note. Yeah, one quick note. Uh, if, if anyone has any questions, feel free to tweet hashtag the brown bag. Uh, or at the brown bag, or just pop a question into the internal chat, and uh, I'll I'll step in and ask Rob the uh, question for you. If you'd like to speak to him directly, since we keep everyone muted by default just due to background noise and things like that, feel free to raise your sorry, feel free to raise your hand, and I'll unmute you, and and, and you can chat with Rob directly. So uh, yeah, there you go, Rob. Let me go ahead and show my screen and. Uh, if any of the attendees can't see this, uh, let me know. We're actually running a Google Hangout within the webinar, and I, I want to make sure that it's it's presenting correctly. All right, cool. go ahead, Rob. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, hello, my name is Rob Hirschfeld. Uh, tonight, I'm going to talk about Open Crowbar and uh, some of the work that we've been doing around that project. It's been going on for over four years now. Um, we're just about at the 2.3 release. Uh, and we've made some incredible progress through the through the 2.x version, and I'm happy to talk about that um, and some of the operational concepts behind it. Um, I'm trying to put my quarters into the demo gods, and it, um, they're getting rejected. So I'm not sure how much of a demo we're going to do versus how much of a discussion uh, we'll have. Uh, and in some ways, that might be more fun because I'll be able to entertain some questions. Um, as far as background, I've been in the cloud and infrastructure as a service business since 2001. Uh, yeah, actually 2001. <laughs> uh, been sort of all over the uh, cloud virtualization and ops space. Uh, back in uh, 2011, at the beginning of the OpenStack days, uh, some co, uh, some of my Dell um, employees, some. Dell people with me co-founded a project called Open Crowbar that was the first OpenStack installer. Um, we expanded that to also be a Hadoop installer and then ultimately to be a bare metal uh, infrastructure uh, tool and platform. And that's, that's really what Open Crowbar has become. Uh, in April, that project was no longer supported by Dell. And in October, uh, the co-founders of the project and I stepped out uh, from, from Dell and from our other job and began a company called RackN, or Racken as we usually call it, uh, to provide uh, support and extensions around the Open Crowbar product. Uh, I'm also heavily involved in the OpenStack uh, ecosystem, and I've been on the one of the founding board members of the OpenStack Foundation, uh, and I still continue to serve. And on that in that capacity, uh, I've been really focused on helping define what OpenStack Core is, uh, and on the the co-chair of the DEF core committee where we're actually working through the process to, to define core. Uh, and, if, and as we go through, I'll try and tie those things together. I'm happy to answer questions in the background. Um, and so I sort of have these twin identities where uh, on one side I'm very focused on physical infrastructure and bringing up baselines and ready state. One side I'm, I'm really uh, a proponent of cloud and cloud operations and DevOps, and they, they really come together for me in scale operations. Um, looks like my demo is going to continue to flake out, so I'm going to jump over to slides and talk through a little bit about what the challenges are. And, and this will, I, I have a lot of information about Crowbar and how it works, um, and we'll, well, I'll get to that very quickly because I assume that's what the audience wants to hear. And, Please uh, tweet questions or, or places where you want more depth 
Uh, I'm going to try and go through quickly since I'm in slide land uh, for the demo, and we'll jump back to the UIs and see if see if things start to behave. So, what we've really seen in the birth of the birth of the Open Crowbar project was that uh, we really saw a challenge where operational complexity and scale uh, was exploding. Uh, OpenStack, Hadoop, uh, Cloud Foundry, Ceph, um, you know, any of these platforms are scale-out platforms, and the systems themselves that run them are very complex also. They usually have uh, multiple NICs. They have a lot of different components and pieces and parts, a lot of operating system options very deep dependency graph chains, uh, and fast release cycles. And what we saw was that people were really getting inundated by dealing with the operational challenges of, of building these platforms. So it's, it's maybe a little bit ironic that to make OpenStack work, which is you know, designed to make operational your operational life simple and give you a virtual machine with an API and very straightforward uh, use cases, right? That's what cloud's all about about that type of efficiency, performance, and elasticity. To do that, you had to go back and, and provide a really, you know, you had to do a really complex setup where network topology mattered, where disk arrays mattered, where enumeration of disk and enumeration of networks mattered, and, uh, you know, there were a whole bunch of different hardware vendors, and when you're buying thousands of servers, you usually want to buy from multiple vendors so that you can manage price and complexity and, and control your supply chain. And so what we found was this interesting challenge of, hey, I want to manage this, this physical infrastructure and get it very repeatable, um, and I want to be able to use the same DevOps practices that we saw uh, exploding in cloud. We wanted to bring them down into physical uh, and make them work in the physical topology. And that's really what, what Crowbar did. It was, it was sort of our driving philosophy. And we ended up with this concept uh, called ready state. Um, and so ready state is, is, I'm showing it as a layer cake here, it's not entirely how it, how, it's, how it works, and we'll explain some of that. But the idea here is that ready state is that you can bring your physical infrastructure up to a point where you've configured the RAID and the BIOS, the operating systems, the networking, uh, your, your, operate, your tool chains for, for controlling infrastructure. Uh, at the time we started with Chef and Puppet, but Salt and Ansible have been really coming into the scene and, and, and creating new opportunities uh, for automation there. And so what we saw was this real need to bring physical gear up so that you could use DevOps tooling as if it was a cloud. So the same type of uh, continuous deployment practice, the same type of uh, start, stop, what, I, what we call apply, rinse, repeat, where you can recycle hardware really quickly, where you can change out how it's configured. Um, those needs were very real in building these scale architectures, these scale infrastructure. Um, and in the last couple of months, with the explosion of containerized workloads, um, it's just as, as prevalent. We're finding people are, are looking to run those uh, against, directly against bare metal. Um, I just did a blog post uh, talking about virtual machines getting squeezed between physical gear and containerized workloads. And what we're really seeing is a couple of years ago, it seemed like we would just virtualize everything and, and walk away, uh, and it hasn't worked out that way. It's really turned out to be a much more complex environment. There are places where you want to run physical, there's places where you want to run containers, there's places where you want to run virtual, and so the world's much more balanced. Um, and then if you want to run virtual, you need to do things like create a software-defined network, which has a very prescriptive, carefully designed underlay, and if that underlay is not right, things start to fall down. And so we really created this environment where we need to have a very automated, very repeatable way to do deployments. And that's, that's really what Crowbar is about. Um, it's, it is in itself a platform. It's really an orchestration system. And it's focused on physical infrastructure. And it's very important to us that we made it uh, able to handle heterogeneous infrastructure. So, even though the program was started in Dell, it was started at Dell on a type of gear that was not the normal gear. It didn't have the normal out-of-band control interfaces. And so we, we built something very generic. Uh, and even today, we, we run on all sorts of different types of hardware. Uh, it doesn't matter. You don't have to run one or the other. It's an and situation. So uh, Supermicro running next to HP, IBM, uh, Dell, and uh, Quanta, and I think we're just at the super, the open compute uh, 
conference. So there's, there's a lot of interesting ways that this, this gear can work together, even if it has very different um, interfaces, even if it enumerates NICs differently. Um, different operating systems is important. Different DevOps tool chains has been important to us. Uh, and then, of course, being able to scale out so that you can talk about hundreds or thousands of nodes and being able to manage the process. Um, and so there a lot of concerns sort of come together in doing this. And one of the things that, that we found is really important here is that it's not just about provisioning an operating system. Um, what we, we really felt that from the very start was that provisioning the operating system was not the hard part in doing this. Uh, a tool like Cobbler, uh, later on Razor came along, um, didn't really handle what we were trying to do. Those are node concerns. We, we really felt that this was a system problem and that we had to, to deal with the system. And, and the reason why we look at it that way, um, and we actually built this, um, I, I did a blog post explaining this in more detail, what, what I've been calling seven layer dip. What we really found was when you're doing a, a configuration, a scale deployment, you have to deal with a lot of different control planes and vectors. You have to be able to deal with the systems the nodes, the individual servers, not as servers, but actually as part of an overall fabric. And so especially in provisioning, especially in physical ops, when I bring up a new system, I want to set the out-of-band management interface. I want to set the DNS end endpoints. I want to connect it to my NTP infrastructure. I need to inject SSH keys. Um, I have to be able to change the boot sequencing. So if I want to install one operating system and then another operating system, I have to be able to talk to my provisioning infrastructure. And so there's no concept, in our opinion, of a node as a standalone thing, uh, the way you sort of would do in a cloud. When we look at a, a physical node, it's actually part of this operational fabric. So you have to deal with all those pieces and parts. Um, and Crowbar out of the box does those things. It'll set IP. PMI by default. It'll uh, understand how to build a Teams 10 gig NIC and put it on the correct, uh, separate on the two different switches. It'll understand switch topography. Um, and, and I'll explain how we do that and why that works. But it's not just doing that on the node and, and getting it out of kickstart files really are very hard to maintain and extend. Um, we, we really took a much more functional programming approach, what we're calling functional ops view to solving this problem. Um, but it's also actually building up a broader infrastructure and understanding that I have to have you know, multiple DNS servers. In some cases, I have to ha understand that I have different IP address zones. Um, for us, it's laying down IPv6, uh, you know, IPv6 infrastructure, which we also include. Uh, and, sort of, and sort of making all that happen. Because it's, it's not good enough to say, oh, I'm going to set up 100 nodes today add 100 entries into my DNS server. What we're really doing is we're, we're working the, that process that slows down in sequence. So for example, when we boot a new machine up, we're going to actually bring up the machine. We're going to do an inventory. We're going to look at everything on the system, let users choose how they want the RAID configured. They can build a, you know, a first two disks in a RAID 1 and then build the rest in a RAID 10 or leave them as JBOD. You have to be able to identify which, which disk is the SSD and then target the SSD for, for applications. So all, those, all that work, all those decisions, are things that Crowbar automates and allows you to then build repeatable automation for. And if um, one of the things that we're a big fan of is rehearsal. If you want to build your automation so that it works in virtual machines first, test it, play with it, make sure everything's going, and then translate that into physical deployments, uh, which is really we consider best practice, then that Crowbar also handles that, so we can abstract virtual, you know, treat virtual gear sort of in the same way that we do with physical. And the way that ends up looking is uh, there's an orchestration system that works through uh, each change as a, as a decomposition. And let me see. I don't think my, my demo is going to come back to life. And I, I've recorded a whole bunch of, uh, a whole bunch of demos, and so um, yeah, my demo is going to just be stuck. And I have some images here that help explain some of that. So the, the way that Crowbar has approached this, this challenge is instead of looking at a deployment as a single thing or a node as a single thing, we've, we've really embraced this concept of functional operations. Uh, and what we've done is we've decomposed 
every action within the system into as small a functional unit as we can, and then we treat that as a very um, as, as a as a unit of work. And that those unit of work are done by Crowbar um, not as a single threaded pass through the architecture, but in an iterative way. So we actually call it annealing. Um, so it's sort of like simulated annealing would be in a computer science term where you iteratively seek a goal. We have an operational concept like that where you can make a change to the architecture, you can make a change to the infrastructure in one of these functional units. So every, in this case, every green check is a completed functional action. And those functional actions are connected to other functional actions. They can be on the node, they can be off the node, they can run in, in the operating system, they could run in our pre-discovery. We have a pre-discovery image where we run an inventory and we can uh, do a systems check, make sure everything's right. We can set the BIOS, we can set the RAID configuration. Um, we can actually do decommissioning and clean the systems up and scrub the disks if we need to. So you know, within each one of these checks, we can do a lot of work. Uh, and then we can add new checks. So if uh, somebody has a unique process where they have uh, to talk to an external system, uh, without modifying Crowbar itself, they can write additional logic steps that are included into the sequence. So the sequence is worked through both on the node, but it, then if you have to go touch other systems, we can touch other systems and make that happen. Um, in a lot of ways, what we've been doing is describing that as a services architecture. So it's, we're using, we're actually using console behind the scenes, um, which is a services registration engine. And we can go in and say, uh, I, have it, I have it running up here. Uh, you can actually go in and register services, operational services uh, with Crowbar. And then Crowbar, instead of building that service, would use that service. So if you had a DNS or an NTP system, or potentially uh, we're starting to add in more services like a salt uh, master, one of our default configurations, installs a salt server in salt master. If you had a salt, ma salt master, it, you could just register that service and then use that master instead of the one that we would install. Um, and so in doing that, what we're, do what we're creating is a much more service-oriented approach to ops. So we're not taking a system and saying, oh, this is one system I need to install the operating system. We're actually decomposing it into uh, each step that we have to do. So when we're bringing up a new system, we're going we're gonna to set the IP addresses on each NIC as separate actions. Right? So if one of them needs to be a bond, we set it as a bond. If one of them needs to be just a plain Ethernet port, it needs to be an Ethernet port. And then Crowbar has abstraction that says, all right, this brand of server with this configuration and this card in it enumerates the NICs in this way so that when you ask for a, ne a network, it's consistent across different hardware types, different hardware configurations. It's consistent from virtual machines to um, a, a system with 20 NICs in it or 5 NICs in it. Um, and we can also understand the concept of BMC networks um, and then handle those and route them correctly. It's one of those, it's, let me see if I have some slides for it. Uh, it ends up being a really significant part of how the system gets put together. Um, and, and all, those, all those chains work. It's also part of how we, we create a heterogeneous support environment. So rather than having to say, oh, we support this operating system on this piece of gear because we've changed the Kickstart file to install a 10 NIC system instead of a 2 NIC system, what we actually do is keep our, 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 our OS installs, and we have, uh, we're over 10 OS installs, uh, very Linux focused and variants of things that are based on Linux. At this point, uh, there's no reason we can't do uh, something like a, a Windows install if that was uh, a preference for somebody. Uh, Open Crowbar is a community project, so we're very excited to work with people who want new capabilities in the community. Um, so uh, this, this slide is, is meant, it's actually uh, a bit of a scary slide. When you have a, a system with a lot of pieces in it, you end up with a lot of moving parts, a lot of chains and components. What, what happens is what we've, done, what, what we've done is we've broken back and we said, look, installing a system isn't a major block item to install an operating system. What you're actually doing is you're installing the operating system, but then you're going to go in and you're going to set up the networking. You're going to attach to the NTP server. You're going to register your entries with DNS. You're going to... Um, Make sure that your logging server is set up correctly. Uh, we actually build a squid proxy fabric so that uh, 
cache hits run through, you know, when you're when you're doing an app update or a yum and yum install going against the cache rather than 100 nodes all going out and getting their own copies of the mirror. Um, so little things like that make a big difference, but they're part of building an integrated fabric. And then uh, Crowbar itself has an abstraction interface against the tool chains so that we can use different tool chains. And one of the things that this graphic is showing is that when Crowbar makes takes actions, it, it, all of these individual functional units don't happen against one tool chain. So we don't just use Chef or we don't just use Bash or you know, Puppet or Salt or uh, out-of-band API calls. Each, in each discrete unit of work has its own what we call a jig or abstraction interface. We use a lot of tool analogies. Um, and so that abstraction interface could be an out-of-band call, out-of-band API call. It could be an SSH uh, interface that goes and runs some script actions. It could run Chef or Puppet or Salt or Ansible, um, depending on what was needed. And it does that in each functional unit. And this is why the functional decomposition, the functional ops is really important to us. Uh, because it's not just, hey, I want to use Chef to set up my, you know, I use Chef, end of sentence. We, we used to hear that a lot, or I use Puppet, and that's the end of the sentence. What we really found was, you know, in, a, in an open stack community, some people might have a really good Chef, uh, chef cookbooks that install OpenStack or install part of OpenStack. And then they might have, you know, a Puppet set of modules that do something really well, and somebody might say, well, I really want to start doing containerized work with Salt. And all of those things are okay. And, and we really wanted people to not have to have a strong, you know, if they've chosen one thing, then lock themselves out of all the other options. And we didn't want, as a community, to say, oh, we're going to pick uh, Chef as the only way to do things. We want to be able to let people use and participate in the communities that they want to commu be in, right? We're talking about ready state as getting the system up to this usable state and then handing off to tools uh, to do the additional provisioning. Okay. And the way that ends up looking uh, is sort of typical. There's Some of these things are, are, are patterned uh, pretty well, and so I feel very, very positive that we, we're using well-established patterns. Um, we'll, use a, we'll do a pixie boot with a discovery image, uh, and then from that discovery image, we actually maintain full control, and we can leave that discovery image up. Um, and you know, pull back data, but then take actions within the discovery image. That would be where you'd run a, um, a test, uh, system validation, check, check things out. Uh, if it's physical hardware and we've identified that we have out-of-band control for it, we actually shut nodes off uh, because if we don't have work, then we stop. If we do have work, then we'll just reboot and we'll continue on the next stages. Uh, provisioning control is really important, so as we move through the process. We're able to change the uh, operating system install, so we can go from discovery image to then automatically transition into installing uh, any one of the OSs that we install. And then when you're done with that, we can go back to the discovery image, clean the systems up, uh, change the drive configurations and BIOS if necessary, and then reprovision it back as a new system, uh, new operating systems, however, however people need new IP addresses, and change everything out. And the way that works is um, we have control of the provisioning. Uh, some of the changes we just made in the last version allow us to start treating that as a service. Uh, so we don't have to own the DHCP server. Uh, a lot of people have this as a challenge. Their networking team says you can't own a DHCP server or run a DHCP server in our network. We own it. Um, we actually can accommodate that. It's a, a lot of what we find is a lot of people doing scale deployments still don't have full control of their operating infra infrastructure. They can't, you know, they have to use a remote DNS and register with the DNS server via an API. And it's perfectly normal. Uh, they can't change the DNS, the DHCP server, that's uh, managed by the networking team. They can't change the top of rack switching. Uh, and so what, what we've really been doing in the last six months with Crowbar is helping it be more adaptive to these brownfield environments because most operational environments are brownfield environments once you've gotten out of the lab. Uh, and then from there, we, this JIG construct lets us actually run different uh, instructions against different systems. So we can build network configurations, and we can go and touch, you know, say, all right, I'm, I'm building a new network interface. I'm adding an IP. 
I need to go register with my DNS server. Uh, you know, and then if I make a change to an IP address, one of the things that Crowbar's uh, chain of logic will do, I think I have a good picture for it. Hey, Rob. Yep. When you get to a uh, stopping point, I've got a question from uh, Mike. Excellent. Um, I'll wrap up the statement and then I'll, I'll stop for the questions. So what the chain of logic can do is it can go back and identify that something's changed and then reapply the logic. Uh, so you, you go back through and, and direct it to say, here's my network, here is, you know, here's the things that are impacted by the network change and then take advantage of that. Please, I, go ahead, Damien, let's get the question. All righty, um, let's see here. All right, Mike, you're off mute. Hey, thanks. Uh, so I had a question uh, looking at the slide, I guess, that you had uh, a couple back, and you were talking about some of those, I guess you call them jigs, the, the way you abstract certain things um, in order to get them done. Uh, yeah, uh, the one before that, yeah. So is, is any part of this, can, can it be a manual process because I mean, everything seems very automated but I'm wondering if if one of those kind of interactions uh, would say kick off a ticket and then a human has to be able to do something and then how crowbar kind of would would work with that if it has to wait for someone to flip a switch or press a button somewhere let's say if you didn't have a, a totally automated infrastructure does it handle that very well, or, or does it really rely on everything being 100% automated? It's a great question. Uh, it does handle it. Uh, and what, what happens is that, that manual step would become a, its own node. It's, own, it's a, what we call a node role, its own, its own functional unit. And the system will identify that. So each functional unit is a, is a, has its own state machine. It's not a, a massive state machine. It's, it's actually a distributed state machine. And inside of that unit, there's a transition state. And so you can put, with the concept of putting an, a, a node role into, the, into a transition state, and it does nothing but wait there. It doesn't consume any worker threads. Uh, it just it exits the worker thread and then waits for somebody to come back and say it's completed that. And then it will uh, move on through the logic. So you can see, one of the things that, that Crowbar does, um, it's hard, it's hard to visualize this, but because it's a dependency graph, that one manual step, you can see the work that's going on before it, you can see the work that's going on after it. Um, and so you would actually say, all right, manual step, go do, and, it, and it, you can add the logic in to go create a ticket. So you could create a ticket in your you know, a JIRA system. And then when that ticket was done, you could come back to the Crowbar's API. So there's a very strong REST API for Crowbar. And you can go back to that REST API and say, okay, I've completed that ticket, go. And the system would then pick up and, and continue the rest of the way through the, the deployment automatically. Um, and, and along those lines, we've actually been doing some integrations with um, something like Chef Provision. Uh, uh, and we're actually starting to look at Docker Machine. Uh, where they have the concept of I want to take a machine out of a pool, so we, you could have hardware in a sort of waiting in a ready state, and then um, use the API to retrieve that machine, hand it over to Chef, let Chef do its do its thing with it, um, mark it as reserved, so Crowbar doesn't doesn't reboot it or try and mess with it, uh, and then when you're done, take it back out of the pool, put give it back to Crowbar and have Crowbar uh, deprovision it and put it back into a available set of machines. Both of those use cases are supported. And one of the things that's worth noting for that is that for us, so we, the version one of Crowbar was, was really very baked in with Chef. Um, and we used long Chef run lists. And we, you know, every, if you're, if you're used to Chef, every one of these nodes, these node roles is, is really maps to a Chef role. And what we found was it was very frustrating to operators to have to troubleshoot a run list of 20, 30, 40 items, and that's what an OpenStack deployment would end up looking like, um, especially on controller nodes where we had a lot of, of, of options. And every one of these, by making every one a discrete action, it fails right there. So if you're having trouble with 
uh, your, your action around setting up DNS clients, um, then it fails right there, and then you remediate, you find out what's wrong, and it gives you very concrete logging about what happened. Um, actually, I suspect my demo will fail in a way that will actually be informative to this. Um, uh, no, it just died. No, yep, there it is. So underneath uh, these actions, so this is this is actually a single node operation, and what you can see very clearly here is that I know what what's been done beforehand. I set up a Chef server. Um, we use a Chef server. Um, it's hard to explain. We actually don't depend on the Chef server except to provide encrypted data bags. We run most everything uh, that we have at Chef and Chef Solo and Puppet. It runs in, in, in Puppet standalone. Um, because we're working on these very discrete units. And in this case, I can see, uh, as I'm setting things up, this network uh, configuration step is in transition. And then I have a whole bunch of work that's blocked. So our goal was to be incredibly concrete and transparent that every step that we were executing, you could see what had happened before, what the dependencies were, what you were doing right now. And this, Mike, to your question, this transition step could be manual. And then what, what, what's going to happen next? And what happens next doesn't have to be on that machine. So if you had dependencies to build a cluster and you had to talk to three machines before you could continue, or if you're building a salt master and you're, you had a minion, you were trying to install a minion, you could actually say, all right, this minion can't complete until my master's built. So that, that ends up being shown here. And then the other thing that was very important to us was that we get great logging. So when any one of these actions completes, you get a very detailed log, uh, success or failure of what happened. Uh, if, if something goes wrong, it's happened at a very small unit with, with good log capture, and you're not logging into the machine to figure out, hey, what happened? How did that, you know, what broke? Which part of the chain broke? Um, and importantly to us, if something does break, it doesn't keep running. Um, we actually made the decision uh, to fail and stop because in our experience, uh, most operational issues are actually operational issues. And if you uh, converge through them, you've actually missed something that would you should actually have fixed. A lot of battle scars on, on overlooking issues, things, warnings that were actually issues. Uh, Mike, if you're still on the line, do you have further questions on that? So, oh, that, um, that's, that explains. Yeah, we were really excited to add that. It's a very easy add into the system. Um, and the design for Crowbar is that every one of these roles in the system uh, is, uh, there's a lot of them because every one represents work units. Um, and every, every, every role, um, I forget where I was going to go with that. Um, every, every role that we add is, is new work that's getting done. Um, and so we, we like having all these extra add-ons. Oh, and it's very important to us that, that you don't have to extend Crowbar core to add custom logic. So the way Crowbar is constructed, there's a core project um, that has this base logic, and you can use it to do con provisioning. Very important to us that it works start to finish, so like IPMI configurations, and you can boot machines and make everything work. But if like the hardware pieces are actually in a separate Git repo, so they're revisioned separately. And if you have custom logic, you don't have to submit them upstream. Submit it upstream. You can build your own Git repo and then add in extra roles into the graph and extend things. Uh, because what we want to be able to do is have the core work in the most general cases and then extend where people where people want. Like some of the commissioning, decommissioning things. Um, are you know are in the main repos yet? We're waiting to see how that would if how they should go if they should go into main repos. Uh, we did a demo with with uh, Packstack. That's actually in its own repo and it, it adds its own pieces. Uh, some of the things like Chef Salt and and Puppet, uh, you know, we felt like those were core. Uh, and the other thing worth mentioning, since I'm cruising through the UI, is we have this concept of no ops. Um, no op is what I call the milestones. Uh, we added them really for testing purposes, but then as we, we got used to how the system operated, we found that they were an essential component to building new orchestration. So uh, a milestone role 
ends up being a repeatable state that you want to achieve. So your OS is installed, your, your system is hardware installed, you've installed OpenStack, um, you've commissioned or decommissioned the system. So we have this, this really significant concept of saying, I've achieved this state of being for the, the node, and then you can build logic that assumes that that's been achieved, so you can build things from OS installed up, or you can build things from OS installed down and do things before the OS is installed um, or before the hardware has been, been fully commissioned. So the ability to have these stable, repeatable points really allows you to build uh, extension logic extensions into how this provisioning is done. So um, a great example would be if you're, um, you wanted to have the system discovered and inventoried and burned in, and then you had to do a manual ticket to tell your networking team to turn on the port. Um, then that would be something, something that you would add. Or um, we're starting to do some work where there's some switch integrations, and you can actually start looking at how you would uh, plug in uh, switch modifications or changes into the infrastructure for that. Um, some of that that's preliminary work, and we're still starting to, you know, talk to people in the community and talk to partners and, and uh, customers about how how to see that that come about. Um, and then there's things, you know, the test jigs. Uh, one of the really interesting concepts that came up in this last release is this role provided concept, uh, where we're really treating uh, ops in a services focused way. So this is where role provided says, all right, I have a DHCP service or DNS service, um, rather than owning the DNS server. So early versions of Crowbar, um, you had to, you know, we would run the DNS server, and every time things changed, we would be the DNS, the authoritative DNS source for everything in Crowbar. And it worked, but it's not very friendly, frankly, um, because we're telling an ops team, hey, you have to use our DNS server. Uh, and so by changing to this service-focused approach, we can run the DNS server, but if you have a DNS server, we can also talk to that. We can go and say, hey, this, this, we just added this IP on this network with this name, please go uh, update the system. And the same, and, and that allows us to be very flexible. And then we can do really exciting changes like letting you rename a system. So if the system's name changes, then we can actually detect that through the attributing system, understand that change, and then know that because the DNS and the system names are tied, go tell the DNS server, wait, now you need to put this new name into the DNS configuration, recover the old one, uh, you know, so you don't end up with a DNS explosion or a key explosion, things like that. So we have very uh, concrete control over things like that. And with the services changes we've just made, it really allows us to work with in-ops environments in, in very friendly ways. And I don't want to over oversell this. We, we haven't created service interfaces for millions of things. This is really a um, the starting point for this. And we're, we're looking to work with the community and, and customers who are interested in how we interface to their, their existing systems and, and which things make sense. So for example, um, a salt stack, I've been talking about salt a lot tonight, um, but you know, a salt master service would allow you to either have us set up salt your salt master or use an externalized salt master. Um, and from Crowbar's, from the downstream perspectives, they would look the same. I'll pause for more questions. Okay. I'm not seeing any right now. That's, that's, that's fine. Um, and I, I, have, I can go deep and far on, on these things. Um, some, you know, obviously, it's my favorite topic. And what, what's worth noting is we've been working in the Open Crowbar community uh, for quite a while. Crowbar started in 2011, um, and then in really two years ago is when we started the refactor for Crowbar 2, but ultimately became Crowbar, uh, Open Crowbar. And Crowbar 1 is still actively maintained by SUSE at the basis of their OpenStack product. Um, it, it, I, I won't go into Crowbar 1 particularly much. It's, it's much more Chef integrated. It doesn't have a lot of these functional abstractions that we added uh, as part of the, the redesign for Crowbar, for Open Crowbar. Um, and a lot of what we, we saw as really beneficial, it was this attribute injection pattern. So I've talked about you know, some of the standards that we're seeing emerge in, in industry. So this 
concept of having a discovery image. We were very early doing that. Um, it seems like a you know pretty standard pattern to run a discovery image, collect inventory, and then move on from there. Um, so that it's nice to see that workflow being widely adopted. We feel like it's a really significant uh, thing. The difference for us is that we don't automatically flow from that discovery image on. Um, our design pattern says that we will hold systems and wait, and then we'll t we we sort of build up systems backwards. So. Uh, the way Crowbar works is that you assert the roles that you want the system to end up with, and then we resolve the graph backwards to figure out what things we have to do. So if you want to be an OpenStack uh, compute node, a compute node is very different than a uh, Ceph node or a Swift node. So those have JBotted designs, and they might care about SSDs, whereas a compute node is typically a RAID 10, a RAID 2, or a RAID 1 plus RAID 10 design. Um, and the NIC configurations are different, and the networks that you set up are different. So there's a lot of there's a lot of changes as you go through and look at systems in different ways. And the idea is, is that you can take your configuration and say, oh, I want to be an a OpenStack uh, compute node, and then work backwards and say, okay, well, that means I need this RAID. That means I need this BIOS. That means I need to lay down this operating system with these components and packages. Um, and so that's, that's a lot of what we've wanted to accomplish here. Rather than saying, oh, I need to know all that up front, I need to know anything up front. And that's, we, we really, we tried to do that in the original, our very early, early days of saying, oh, we're going to walk into a site with a whole bunch of knowledge and information about how it's going to be set up. And something as simple as people not wiring the switches the way you expected would cause your whole topology to fall apart. Um, or worse, people wiring inconsistently and you're not discovering that because you had assumed it was correct. Um, both of those things were fault cases. And so what we really had to do was work out um, processes that let you make those adjustments in the field. And then uh, one of the things that people really like, so Crowbar has a um, uh, has a CLI in it where I can come in and say, all right, I want to do take actions, and I can do a crowbar nodes uh, redeploy. You know, uh, my node, my node name is foo.racken.com. Redeploy. It's not going to work because my, my demo's on. But um, and say redeploy, and the system will literally just go in and then turn that node over um, and set it up, reimage it, take it back through the process. Uh, same thing, you could delete a node and then rediscover it and put it back through the process. And because of the way things work, you can tell Crowbar, all right, I already know what I want this thing to be. I know the MAC address. I know the IP address. I know the name. And I know what target I want, what OS I want to install on it. Go. You can assert that right at the beginning. And then when Crowbar discovers that node and it goes through the process, it's going to go all the way through that, that system and do all that work. Um, and one of the things we found people like is this isn't just used in production deployments. It's actually used in tests and, and POCs and labs because that's where we're turning over a deployment 10 times a day, right? The, the, the team at, at Dell, when we were doing our work on this and trying to build OpenStack deployments, was you know doing five to six OpenStack deployments a day. You know, somebody make a tweak to something. Oh, I'm going to try it, and you'd rerun the whole deployment. Um, on a six-node system, and so this was a significant time saving for being able to apply what I call apply, rinse, repeat uh, your deployments. And you know, frankly, that's DevOps best practice. If I'm going to build robust DevOps, I'm not going to get it right the first time, uh, and I'm not going to experiment with it in my production system. I'm going to work it until I get it right. And that's, and that's actually part of our upgrade story. Uh, one of our design patterns, let me see if I have a slide for this. Um, one of our design patterns um, has really been that because we handle incremental change and we handle this um, little bits and pieces at a time, you could feed in these series of, of changes as an install, as an upgrade process. So get your install right and then make an incremental step, an incremental step, a step, an incremental step, and allow those things to become your upgrade. Uh, and the reason why that's important for us is, you know, Crowbar is not in itself an upgrade tool. We're not trying to make Crowbar detect and do smart upgrades and things like that. There's some really excellent people in market who are doing HA Elastic, 
you know, upgrade and self-healing and things like that. What we found was the problem is that you, you know, for all the, the great logic and brains and things like that that people did, it was very hard to repeatedly and reliably make the changes that were being dictated by the upgrade script or make the changes that were being dictated by the drain all the VMs off the system and reset it and re it and then put it back in the infrastructure as a, as a working node. We really focused on making sure that that process was highly repeatable and stable so that when you wanted to make those changes, you could make them in a reliable way with an API-driven infrastructure. In, in a way, it's a cloud, it's a cloud story. Um, and I wanted to talk about abstraction, but I'll pause for questions because we're ten minutes. We're ten minutes in. Ten minutes out. Ten minutes in the end. Damien, any any new questions coming in? Uh, no, sir. None that I've seen. Um, I see a comment about VRA or VRO. Um, yeah, from uh, from Mike. Yep. Okay. Oh, okay. Uh, one of the things, it was interesting, somebody was, I was describing Open Crowbar to somebody the other day, and they were like, well, can't you just use VMware to do that? And I'm like, right. Yes. You know, that was actually, to me, a big compliment that somebody confused what we do with physical with something that you would expect on a virtual system, right? That type of, you know, I ask for a machine and have it provisioned and configured the way you, you needed it to be. Um, one of the things that, that is a little bit confusing uh, with this, that I like to talk about hardware abstraction, um, and that sometimes gets me into trouble in exactly that that sort of thinking. When when we talk about hardware abstraction for Crowbar, we're not abstracting the hardware like a virtualization layer. We're not creating this northbound API where you say, oh, I need a machine that looks like this. Just give me a machine that looks like that. Unfortunately, it's not that simple. Um, the, the reality is that our goal is to make physical deployments repeatable, but we we can't, we really don't want to hide the fact that there's a physical deployment. We don't want to hide the network topology. We don't want to hide the disk or the network topology. What we really want to do is we want to make it so that when you do a scripted deployment, that scripted deployment works even if the, the gear itself is, is heterogeneous or different or something has changed. So if the NICs enumerate differently, we want to hide that from you but we don't want to hide the fact that you want a, t a bonded 10 gig NIC. So it, it's sort of this interesting balance with abstraction. It comes with the functional programming approach. So if you, if you think about what we've done with these, these individual actions being very discrete uh, functional units, they have very clearly defined inputs as a contract. They have very clearly defined outputs as a contract. It's, it's attributes. Thing. And then the jigs provide an abstraction for the work that goes on inside that box. Those inputs and outputs allow you to then create a flow of work where if I want to set up a network, and we, we set up our, each network discreetly. So when you ask for a new network, you're actually asking for a functional unit. That network gets set up and configured in the system as a, as a single item. So if you wanted a bonded 10 gig NIC, we have an abstraction called a conduit that says give me a Actually, I can show it in the UI. That would be helpful. Uh, in the in the networking interface, we have this concept of building a network, uh, attaching it. So I haven't even talked about scope boundaries. So we have a concept of scoped boundaries, and I can specify that I want this network attached to a VLAN, built in a team, set up as a bridge, and I can give it a name. Uh, in this case, foo. Uh, and then that foo network is passed from that role downstream as, as the foo network. And whether it's set up as E0 on a virtual machine or is it set up as uh, EN1 or EN6 or logical NIC 28, it, it doesn't really matter. Right? We're going to set up that, that configuration based on what you asked for for that site. But when we feed it downstream to the next, the next functional unit, that functional unit is asking for the foo network. And what what and this is where things get, get exciting, but also a little bit you have to think a little bit differently from the DevOps perspective. What 
you need to be able to do is say, all right, I'm going to code my DevOps instructions not to bond to ETH0, but to actually say, well, I'm going to consume this settable attribute. Um, in, in Chef has some concepts around this. Uh, actually, all of the DevOps tools have concepts around passing attributes into them, uh, but they're not always used because you know people don't have something that feeds the attributes in. Crevar feeds those attributes in, and so if you build your script to say use the attribute for the foo network when I build my my database and attach it not to ETH1 but to whatever network you know, whatever attribute is set to bond to, and when I'm done, put back my information as a new attribute, and then that gets passed down to the following chain of logic. Using that pattern makes you incredibly robust for abstracting the underlying infrastructure, because Chromar passes you the information you need, and it takes care of making sure that everything is set up right. So if you're dealing with, um, you know, a, a complex 10 gig system with you know, four 10 gig ports and you want it on two bonds on two different networks, we take care of that. We tell you which ones to attach to. Um, and if you just have a VM that you're testing against with two NICs on it, or one NIC, we'll set that up and we'll pass it in just as if it was the same network. And so your downstream logic doesn't change. That's what we, we, we mean by abstraction. What we're doing is we're, we're allowing you to pass attributes in regardless of what happened upstream. This is why the milestones are so important. This is why the functional programming concept is so important. And a lot of the magic about Crowbar is that we've created this functional ops model. Um, it's, it's really about how we think about the problem as much as the infrastructure that we've built that runs the jobs and the annealing and, and all this work that, that actually, you know, where we actually have to deal with the mess of real hardware. Um, and so that's a lot of the, the bits and pieces that are going through. But I would, what I would encourage people to do, if you're interested in how the model works, uh, we've created a Docker container um, that has the infrastructure. Uh, basically, you can bring up a Docker container. That Docker container can actually be attached to a real Ethernet port and can boot physically here. So I, I actually routinely at home, especially when my demo works, we'll, we'll boot physical those against the um, against my Docker container and, and start playing with boots and reboots and OS installs and, and there's some tools to do VMs and so you can actually build a full system pretty quickly and run through this, this sort of demo. Um, I have I think two hours of actual video footage that will walk people through this. Um, we have a pretty active community uh, of people trying it out and playing with Chromar in different ways. Uh, Damien we're at the bottom of the hour, so it's a good time to wrap it up. If there's any last questions, um, yeah, I'm, I'm not seeing anything at either the uh, Twitter account or on the hashtag. Uh, anyone that's on the call, do you have any questions? Uh, pardon, what were we seeing, Rob? Um, I was hoping we didn't put anybody to sleep. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> All right, hope not. It's uh, one of those. I, I love to talk about this stuff. I'm sad the demos didn't go because the demos are snappy, but I get to talk about the, the theory behind what we've done, um, which in a lot of ways is, is more important. If you, if you understand that, then what we've done makes, makes even more sense. Um, and I'm looking. I'm trying to bring up some of the resources and sites for people. Um, so the, the project is Open Crowbar uh, on GitHub, and you can you can sort of tunnel through that. The, uh, and find out where the resources are. Uh, I'm vehicle on, online. I'm always happy to do that. And of course, my blog. Um, I, I keep a lot of information about Crowbar against my blog, and you can go in and do that uh, and look there for information. Uh, and of course, the the company we started is called Racken. And um, we have a very basic website. Um, sort of doesn't doesn't explain everything that we do, but uh, we're always happy to. Uh, Engage with people both through the community channels, but directly, uh, and, and you know, help people you know, get more hardware and extend the scope of what what this product and uh, project can do. Uh, All right, Damien, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I've got uh, see, someone has their hand raised. Uh, Mike, I'm going to unmute you again. My assumption is that you'd like to talk. All right, you're unmuted. Thanks, Amy. 
So, oh, what's a good way to uh, kind of get started with this? I mean, if I uh, if I don't have a, a bunch of hardware I could like physically use, I mean, is there um, is there a good way to get started in uh, with some virtual machines um, or locally using Vagrant? I mean, uh, like if I just want to start playing around with it. So definitely, you don't need physical gear to run Crowbar. Um, we have a, there's a fast start link off of the README that'll start you if, with a doc. You can there's a couple ways. So if you're using Windows, you can use uh, VirtualBox or VMware and run a Sense 66 system and install Crowbar in it. Um, we have documentation for doing that. If you if you have access to a Linux system, uh, you can do the fast start with Docker and and uh, actually just check out the code and, and, and boot up Docker, and then you can basically have to download whichever operating systems you want to install, um, which is a one-time thing and it will get you going. But yeah, if you check out the README page, um, it's very easy to, to pull down these resources and get started. Um, if somebody wants to do a Vagrant up for this, uh, we have people who have been expressed interest in that. Uh, I'll be very straight, I'll be very honest, we use the Docker containers uh, for development because they're really quick to re recycle and recover, um, and we haven't spent as much time playing with Vagrant from that perspective. But it, it, we'd love to have somebody doing this, right? Open community. Please come. And uh, you're all, you'd also be coming in. So we just since we're just finishing, uh, we use tool names and, and letter. Uh, incrementing letters, so we just finished our camshaft release, so there's a lot, the, the, the code's actually in a very good stable spot if you want to play with it, um, and then we're cranking up, uh, the next release is called Drill, uh, and we're, we have weekly design uh, meetings where we review the backlog of work and we use all the normal tools, so there's a waffle board with our, our backlog, and we, you know, people submit bugs against uh, GitHub and we burn them out. Is this a, a pretty uh, well adapted to building uh, an entire like a uh, vSphere de deployment? Can you deploy ESXi with this and its associated components. So ESXi is one of the capabilities that we've we've just been adding as an OS, and I'm happy to talk to you about that. Um, it's not something that's very nascent, uh, but yes. Uh, we can definitely do that, and if it's of interest, um, we can we can talk about what it would take to build out a full cluster. Mm -hmm. Very cool project. I like it. Thank you very much for presenting tonight. Thank you. My pleasure. All right. Well, I I I think that uh, wraps up the questions. So. Uh, just wanted to thank you for your time, Rob, and I, I thank everyone else for, for stopping by and uh, for also downloading this in the future. And uh, like I said at the top of the hour, if you have any questions, feel free to tweet at the brown bag or tweet Rob at, at vehicle. Rob, what was your blog address again? It's Rob Hirschfeld. Rob, it's robhirschfeld.com. Excellent. I think that's pretty easy to remember. <laughs> Alrighty, well, thanks again, and uh, to everyone, have a good night and a great week. Excellent. Thank you, Dave. Thank you. Appreciate it.